My obsession with time started early. As a speed skater and cyclist, I spent more than 20 years chasing time, trying to compress more laps, more strokes, more meters, more miles in the same amount of time. And I was fortunate in that my big investment in time brought me to the Olympics where by the smallest increment of time, I was able to take home a silver medal from the Winter Olympic Games. So you can imagine that small amounts of time really matter to Olympic athlete. Let me tell you why. Here are the results from the 2002 Winter Olympic Games in the 500 meter. Now, this wasn't my event, but I don't want you to focus on the times themselves. I want you to focus on the differences. In this case, the difference between the gold medal and the silver medal, two one hundredths of a second after a lifetime of training. Now take a look at the difference between first and 10th place. 33 one hundredths of a second separated first from 10th. So the difference between the gold medal and a hero's welcome and being sent back to Siberia to train for four more years because he got 10th place at the Olympics was the difference between these two claps. Ten guys went by in that space of time. Crazy, right? My life oddly considered, continued to center around time as I moved into the working world. My very first job was spent with a team preparing for an entire year for one second, Y2K at Goldman Sachs. And yes, it's true, I did time at Enron. I built them trading systems to decrease trade times and increase trade velocity. And it was about this time in my life that my fascination with time morphed. And I began to notice a distinction between chronological and linear time and what I'll call experiential time. Now, chronological time, you all know what that is. It's like watch on your wrist, the clock on the wall. It's the way we make it to planes, trains, and meetings. But experiential time is anything but linear. It speeds up, it slows down, it stops. And we've all experienced this, right? You have the long, boring business meeting where you look at your watch after what seems like three hours and 20 minutes has gone by. And the inverse is true, right? A great friend comes in from out of town and you look at your watch after a few drinks and you think 20 minutes has gone by and three hours have gone by. But what made me crazy and fueled my obsession was this notion that time itself was accelerating, that each summer was getting shorter than the last. 98% of adults feel this, 98%. So life isn't just short. It's actively getting shorter. So I have some bad news for you. I've graphed this, I've done the math, and it's way worse than you think. <laughs> when I made this graph, I was 43 years old, and according to the actual tables of somebody my height and weight, my life expectancy was 86. And I look around the room, there's a variety of ages here, but on average, we're not too far apart, so you're about half done, right? Wrong! There's no such thing as chronological time! We have to have a different axis for this. We have to measure this in a different way, the way we actually experience time. And how the hell do we do that? Well, we talked before that summers an eight-year-old last forever. Well, I can't plot infinity. So let me instead be conservative and assume that a summer as an eight-year-old starts to feel an awful lot like a year as a 20-year-old. And that starts to feel an awful lot like a decade in middle age. Now, for those of you math majors in the room, if you plot the area under the curve, the remainder is the value of your life. That's not half done. That's a sliver. Let me plot this a different way. Let's hold the y-axis constant and let the x-axis go logarithmic. And here we see that halfway is at age 18. And by age 43, you're not half done. You're 92% done. There's only 8% left. The fat lady has sung, the final chord has struck, you're at the end. Is anybody else besides me horrified? <laughs> well, after I did this math, I was bound and determined to do something about it. I had to fix this, and so I read everything I could. Kahneman, Cheeksby sent high, Eagleman, Vanderkam, some people in the room. And what I found was there was ample evidence for this cognitive bias towards time and its acceleration, but what I didn't find was what to do about it. But I'm happy to report to you that by experimenting on myself and doing research over the last few years, I've uncovered three rules that govern experiential time that will allow you to manipulate cognitive time and experience summers that last forever. Let's talk about all three. The first is contraction. The second is inversion. And the third and most important is expansion. Now, the law of contraction, we've already covered the gist of this, and this is the notion that all things being equal, time each year that passes will start to accelerate. And why is this? Well, let me give you a metaphor here. The metaphor is that of a garden hose. I think that time flows through your brain and my brain just like water flows through a garden hose. And the physics here is simple. When you constrict the flow of water through a garden hose, it speeds up. 
This is what our brains are doing to time. They are constricting the flow of time through our brains. And why is this? Well, let's look at the brain of an eight-year-old. And instead of base time's height for the aperture of this conduit, let's consider breadth of experience times depth of experience. And consider the life of an eight-year-old. Everything is new, right? So they have incredible breadth of experience, right? First baseball game, first time to the ocean, first time to Disney World, and they have incredible depth of experience, right? First crush, first win, skin knees, broken glasses. They get into fights. Eight-year-olds cry a lot. So their aperture for time is expansive, breadth and depth. And so time trickles through and summers last forever. Now let's consider a 20-year-old. For 20-year-olds, they've declared a major or maybe they've entered the routine of a job and they've developed a distaste for discomfort. And so they generally try to avoid crying. And so their conduit for time in their brain starts to shrink. And it's at this point in life that most people start to feel that acceleration begin. And now let's look at middle age. At middle age, I know this wouldn't apply to you in the room, but many of the people I know in middle age have very routine lives. They do the same things, they go to the same places, they have the same commute to the same job with the same coworkers doing the same stuff. They eat at the same restaurants, they even go to the same places on vacation, and their conduit for time shrinks, and time begins to accelerate, and a decade begins to feel like a year. So what to do about it? Well, a lot of people right around their 30s and on up start to get this sense that life is passing them by. So they start to take on new experiences, things like yoga, or they sign up for a triathlon, or they take uh, voice lessons. And this is all good. It expands the breadth of their experiences. But more often than not, there's no real emotional engagement. So all it really does is flatten that hose, and it doesn't really slow it on time. So how to experience the passage of time like an 8-year-old? You have to expand the breadth and depth of your experiences. If you sign up for vocal lessons, sign up to sing in front of 500 people. If you sign up for a triathlon, care about winning. If you, if you go to Toastmasters, sign up to speak at Chicago Ideas Week. Now, how to know if you're doing this right? If you're not willing to cry over the outcomes of your new experience, then you will not slow down time like an eight-year-old. But you're willing to take the risks and emotionally invest then you will experience summers like you did as a kid. Let's talk about the second law. Thank you. The second law is the law of inversion, and this is the notion that time as you experience it in the present is often inversely proportional to the way you remember it. And here's what's important about this. Remembered time governs your entire experience with time. Only memory counts. So imagine if your job was to enter a series of digits, numbers, letters, and symbols into the green screen of a computer 35 to 50 characters long, and there was a check digit, so if you got it wrong, it flashed, disappeared, and you had to start over, and you had to do this for eight hours a day. This was my job in undergraduate school on the weekends. I can tell you that time nearly stopped in that room, each second bloating with the tedium and boredom. Now let's, let's look at another day. Think about that first day before a seven-day vacation take a half day at work, you fly into the office, you get through your task list, you run to the airport, you get on the plane, you get off, you take the cab to the airport, you, you, to the hotel, you go out on the beach, you take a walk on the beach, you have a nice sunset, you have a cocktail, a nice dinner, you take a night swim, and that whole day is over in a flash. So both of these are one linear day, yet one felt like an eternity in the present and the other was a fleeting glimpse. So you might conclude the best way to expand time is to design a whole bunch of days full of tedious, boring tasks. But remember, Memory governs your sense of time. And here's where it gets interesting. When I plot these, the days and digits, typing those into the computer, in the present it took forever, but in the past it disappears to nothing. Everything that I know about my experience typing those digits into the computer, you now know. There's nothing else. But the first day of vacation, right, it expands in memory. So what's going on here? I think the metaphor here is like two cameras. The first example is like a surveillance camera. It's running at a plodding along at a slow frame rate. It's black and white grainy. There's no sound and it disappears to nothing in memory. But the first day of vacation, it's like an HD camera. It's running so fast you can't keep up with it in the present. That's why it flies by. But boy, when you have time to reflect, you can zoom in, rewind. It's lights, color, action, sound. So how do you manipulate the second law in your favor? You have to replace. Routine and repetition with memory and meaning. Yes, the days will fly by in the present, but they'll expand well beyond their hours in memory. All right, let's talk about the third law. 
The third law is the most counterintuitive, but the most important. And this is the notion that you can, in your life, design moments where your experiences and the environmental cues around you can actually not just slow and stop time, but actually expand and create time. Let's talk some physics for a second. If you take two clocks, put one on the Earth, put the other on a space shuttle, send it around the planet a few times, when it comes back, it's going to read a little bit slower than the first. We take this to the extreme. You put that second clock near a massive gravitational object, like a black hole, and there's a place near that object where time stops relative to the outside world. And that moment and location where time stops is called an event horizon. And I believe we can create event horizon moments in our life. Think for a moment, is there a day, an incredibly meaningful day, that you would trade away a month of boring days for in order to keep it? Take it to that extreme. Is there a minute, a moment of such scintillating beauty, of such gravity, intensity, and meaning that you would trade away an entire year of routine days for it? Well, what if you could orchestrate and design five of those a year or 10 of those a year? If you could do that, you wouldn't live 43 more years, you would live 430 more years. And there's a man who's done exactly that, and his name was Eugene O'Kelly. Eugene O'Kelly was the CEO of KPMG, and at age 57, Eugene O'Kelly was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and given 90 days to live. What he did next was amazing. He designed the remaining moments of his life to maximize his time on earth. And here's what he did. He recognized that people and experiences were what mattered most, and he separated all the people he loved into circles, and then he began unwinding them from the outside in to his core family by saying goodbye in the best way possible. So for the outer circles, peers, mentors, uh, co-workers, he would just have a phone call or walk in the park and he would express his gratitude for everything they'd done for him and then he would say goodbye forever because he would not have time to say goodbye again. And then for the next two inner circles, he recreated the way they first bonded. This is family and friends and extended family. And they would do whatever they did the first time they met or when they really bonded, a baseball game or a specific restaurant. And it was right around this time that his experience with time began to morph and he recognized that it was changing and he began to create what he called in his own words, perfect moments where time stopped. And finally, the most intense, his nuclear family and best friends, he had to say goodbye forever to them as well. And for them, he created bucket list experiences, things they would remember long after he was gone. And finally, the hardest part of all, he had to unwind and say goodbye to his 14-year-old daughter forever. And for her, he planned a trip to Prague and then to visit the Inuit. And if you remember anything from today, remember this. Right around 30 days into his last 90 days, Eugene O'Kelly recognized something that has fundamentally changed my life. He realized that he was going to live longer than if he had never gotten cancer at all. I love the, the last two lines in Eugene, Eugene O'Kelly's book. The chapter begins with, I was blessed. I was told I had three months to live. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. I don't know about you, but I want to really live. There is no such thing as chronological time. <laughs>